Well, it's good to see everyone here this evening, this beautiful day that we've had, and no finer way to bring it to a close than to gather around the Word of God and see if we can't learn a little bit of it. Uh, We're in Revelation chapter 13. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you, and that's where we'll be tonight. Uh, Revelation 13 is one of the more difficult texts in the book, I think, Uh, but I do hope that we can make some kind of sense out of it. The last time we looked uh, at this chapter, we noted the description of the first beast, and we suggested that this first beast is a symbol of Rome, that uh, all of his imagery together suggests that he represents Rome, the Roman Empire, Roman power, uh, for several reasons. First of all, he comes from the sea, which suggests a vast domain. Uh, He is also built out of the imagery from Daniel chapter 7, which is a retelling of what we were told in Daniel chapter 2, four successive world kingdoms. And uh, that suggests to us that this beast is kind of the culmination of the wickedness or the power, at least, of all of them. The fourth one would, again, be Rome. Uh, We noted that there is a uh, reference here to one of his heads as if it had been slain, And we suggested that that might have made sense to people living in the first century in Asia Minor as a reference to the story that Nero had come back to life uh, in the form of the emperor Domitian. But it is, of course, also kind of an imitation of the lamb that we saw in chapter 5, so it has kind of a dual purpose. Um, We noted also that there is a... uh, description here of this beast speaking blasphemously, and that fits well with what we know also about the Roman emperor cult in the first century. And so we've tried to make the case that the first beast represents Rome in all of its strength, all its ferocity, all of its wickedness and evil, but that's not all there is to it. We're going to see here in chapter 13 Uh, continuing on in verse 11, that there is a companion to this beast. And we're going to try to make sense out of him this evening. So if you will pick up uh, Revelation chapter 13 with me, starting in verse 11. John says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. This beast is presented in specifically religious imagery, uh, in contrast to the first beast, who is represented in more nationalistic terms. Uh, We are not told what this beast looks like in so great of a detail as we were as the first beast. We are told simply that he is like a lamb in appearance, having horns like a lamb would have, and yet his speech betrays that he is not a lamb, that he is indeed speaking as the dragon. He outwardly resembles a lamb, or perhaps we should say he outwardly resembles the lamb. And that does not mean that he is imitating Jesus uh, in particular. It simply means that he is passing himself off as some kind of deity, the kind of deity that Jesus should only be recognized as having. However, as we noted there in verse 11, that he spoke as a dragon, and of course by this time not just any old dragon is in the picture, but the one that we saw in chapter 12 the one that tried to destroy uh, the Messiah, then tried to destroy the people. We were told about this dragon in chapter 12, that he is the devil, he is Satan, the serpent of old, who deceives the whole world, who is at war with God and with his saints. And you'll notice also uh, in verse 11 that he does not come up out of the sea. He is of a different domain, as it were. He comes up out of the earth. And we might say, well, you know, what difference could it possibly make? 
But remember uh, that to people in Asia Minor in the first century, uh, the sea would represent Roman power, its connection with the Mediterranean, but the land would suggest maybe their own territory. And so many have suggested that this beast has some connection with Asia Minor itself, and we're going to try to explore that connection here if we can this evening. Uh, so he is perhaps more local than the first beast, and yet he is connected with this blasphemy. And verse 12 tells us that he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and makes those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. I want to suggest to you that uh, a very good candidate for ad identifying the second beast is an organization that was known as the Commune of Asia. It may be that you've never heard of this organization, and that's okay if you haven't. It's not like it was, you know, the kind of thing that you would read about on every page in an ancient history book. But the Commune of Asia was a provincial organization. It was made up of representatives of the major cities of Asia Minor. And every province had one of these. There was a commune in Bithynia. There was a commune in Galatia. There was a commune in Cappadocia. And there was one in Asia. And what they did is they kind of uh, acted like a collective assembly of the major cities to work in cooperative efforts, specifically and uh, particularly in the emperor cult. Uh, the the uh, representatives who made up the commune of Asia were each called an Asiarch. And the reason I bring that to your attention is because people by that title are mentioned in the New Testament. You may remember in the book of Acts, chapter 20, I believe it is, at the riot at Ephesus, that Paul wants to go into the theater and address the mob, and it says that some of Paul's friends who were Asiarchs told him not to go in. These men would have been the local representatives of Ephesus to this organization. The president, and you held the term for one year, and then it would be passed on to somebody else, but the president of this organization served as chief priest of the emperor cult in the province. And this commune or this organization did several things, but in the first century it did one thing more than it did anything else, and that is it administered and organized the worship of the Roman emperor in Asia Minor. Now, we look at that and we say, what a strange thing to do. Why would these people do this? And our first reaction might be, well, maybe Rome told them to do it. But the fact is that that wasn't the case. There was no law anywhere in Rome that said you had to worship the emperor as a god, uh, at least uh, specifically in, in those kinds of terms like that. Uh, they, the people in the province weren't told that they had to do this. This was something they did voluntarily. And the reason they did this voluntarily is to promote goodwill with Rome. They wanted to let Rome know that we are cooperative with you, that we are not going to be causing any kind of trouble, that we are open to Roman culture and all the money that comes along with being friendly to the emperor and the government. And so it was in their interest financially and politically to show their loyalty to the emperor. And the main thing that this organization did was make sure that it was known in Rome that the province was doing its job and worshiping the emperor, giving him proper homage. The commune of Asia was not an official arm of the Roman government. So it was not, you know, a legal part of government, uh, Roman government or anything like that. And as such, it had no authority to make laws. And so, you know, they could not write a law that said you had to do this or do that. And we have suggested already in our look at the book of Revelation that 
the problem that these people are facing is not one of official government-sponsored persecution, that it is local social persecution. It wasn't that Rome had passed a law outlawing Christianity. That would come later on in history. But what had happened is that these people in these provinces had decided, we're going to make sure that the emperor knows that we're giving him homage. And we're going to build temples, and we're going to hold these festivals in honor of the emperor and have everybody come and participate. And if you didn't participate, well, it wasn't illegal not to participate. But people could make life difficult for you if you didn't. Maybe they would just stop patronizing your business and you would never sell another thing again. Maybe if you were a tradesman that you couldn't get a job if you didn't show up to the emperor's festival or go, go down to the emperor's temple. Or maybe your house would catch fire mysteriously some night and nobody knew who did it. Uh, those kinds of things. Uh, it was not, again, a law that had been passed outlawing Christianity or enforcing emperor worship, but it was this spontaneous thing that everybody was expected to go along with. This would have been the actual thing that Christians would have come into contact with in their day-to-day -day dealing with the situation in Asia Minor. And so I want to suggest to you as a possibility this evening that this second beast represents this organization as it is promoting the worship of the Roman emperor in the province. You'll notice the way it is described, that he makes the earth and those who dwell in it. That's Remember, that's John's way of talking about people who aren't Christians. He makes them to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. And that's certainly what the commune of Asia did. It drafted these decisions, we're going to do this, we're going to have people show their homage to the emperor, and while it wasn't official Roman law, it certainly came close to that. You'll notice also the language there in uh, verse 12, that he exercises the authority of the first beast in his presence. And that little phrase might not sound like much, but it is actually a phrase that is used in the Bible to describe the language of a servant, that a person who serves is in the presence of somebody else. Uh, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 75, for example, somebody else can go to 1 Kings uh, 17, if you would. But in Luke chapter 1, John would serve in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. He would do it before him in his presence. Somebody have uh, 1 Kings 17, 1? Could read that passage for us? Go ahead, James. In Elijah the Tishbite, the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years to shut down. Before whom I stand. And Elijah certainly means that I am the servant of God in telling you this. And so the language that is used here suggests that this is a servant in some sense of Rome, uh, not Rome itself. And there is plenty of evidence for this uh, commune of Asia. Uh, it shows up basically on coins because the temples, uh, most of the temples are not there any longer. But there are plenty of... Uh, depictions of temples on Roman coins, and you can see this coin here. Uh, this coin was actually minted by the Commune of Asia. You see the letters C-O-M, and then more faintly A-S-I. Here in the drawing it appears a little better, and you can see in the uh, uh, top of the temple Rome and Augustus. It meant that that was the temple where you worship the goddess Roma and Augustus. And this is in, uh, depicting the imperial temple at Pergamum, uh, which was uh, dedicated in the early part of the second century, just a few years after John wrote this book. And so you can get a sense there of uh, the, the authority of the commune of Asia in minting this coin with the emperor's likeness. And here's another coin. Again, this comes from the city of Pergamum. It has a picture of Augustus on the front, and you can see C.A., for commune of Asia 
on the back of that. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing that even though it is perhaps not so well known to us, it would have been very well known to the ancients. Here's another one of these coins. This is from the early part of the second century. And again, you can see C-O-M-A-S-I on the edge of the coin, commune of Asia. Here you see again the uh, temple Roma and Augustus. And you have Roma and Augustus depicted as being worshipped in the temple there. And so I want to suggest to you that that's what John is describing here this organization that was enforcing emperor worship to the ability that it could. All right, uh, verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to earth in the presence of men. So like a good false god, he works signs to convince people that he really is real. And signs, of course, are displays of authority, legitimate signs and false signs as well, displays of God's authority and uh, uh, false authority, respectively. Uh, and, of course, genuine prophets of God did this. Uh, Elijah uh, uh, is particularly connected in the Old Testament with these celestial kinds of signs not making it may rain, making it rain, calling down fire out of heaven, those kinds of things. And so it shouldn't surprise us, uh, as the religious imagery kind of piles up here, that this particular religious organization should have something about it that is designed to legitimate it to other people. And of course, this is a part of ancient culture that maybe we're not so familiar with, but in just about any town you went to in the ancient world, you could have found a sorcerer, maybe several of them. And they, they pop up pretty frequently in the book of Acts as Paul goes traveling through the cities on his uh, journeys. And what were sorcerers? They were people who claimed that they were in touch with the divine and that for a $20 bill or a $50 bill, they could actually summon that power and make it work for you. Now, of course, they were all a bunch of shysters and, and hoodlums, but it was a regular part of ancient culture. And there is every indication that a lot of people believed in them. And before we start saying, well, what idiots, let me remind you that... Thousands of people believe in this today. And we're supposedly a little more educated than they were. And so this idea that people want to believe that there's something out there that maybe they can contact it has always been true of man almost from the very beginning. And it was true in the ancient world as well. Interestingly enough, um, the ancients had devices that could simulate the sound of thunder in a theater. They had devices that could simulate a flash of lightning in a theater. And so this idea that they made fire come down out of heaven might not just be symbolic of false signs in general, but may actually refer to some trick that was pulled in the emperor cult. I would remind you that many of the emperors associate themselves with the god Jupiter, and the symbol of Jupiter is the lightning bolt. And so it is likely, I think, that we have here a reference to something that probably actually happened in some kind of cult ceremony. Uh, we're going to see another thing in verse 15 here in just a moment. But it says in verse 14 that he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So he does this job of deceiving, which could simply be John's way of saying that they promote the worship of the emperor as a god. And... He tells those people to make an image. Now, of course, one of the things that showed your loyalty to the emperor 
more than anything else was to build a temple in his honor and put his statue inside it. And so if this really is the commune of Asia, we certainly know from the historical records that that's what they did. They commissioned the building of temples with images of the emperor inside. We have clearly here, it seems to me, an, a reference to imperial cult statues as well as perhaps images on coins. Uh, I would have you recall the letter that we looked at at the beginning of our study written by the Roman governor Pliny in Bithynia at the early part of the second century as he is writing to the emperor Trajan to get advice on what to do with Christians. And he says that uh, I had these people rounded up, I had them repeat an invocation to the gods and offered adoration with wine and frankincense to your image, which I had ordered to be brought for that purpose. So we do know that these images were used as tests of loyalty as early as the first part of the second century. Pliny's letter is dated to somewhere around 112, 114 uh, A.D. Uh, and he talks here about some Christians who denied that they were. He says, they all worshipped your statue and the images of the gods and cursed Christ. Well, that certainly sounds a lot like what we have going on here in verse 14, that he causes them to make an image and worship it. But not only that, verse 15, it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. There's a couple of ways I think we could understand verse 15. Uh, it may be that it is a reference to simply the, the oracles from the deified emperor, that if you went into the emperor's temple that a priest would tell you that the emperor says so-and-so, that the communication from the god is such-and-such. Such. Others have suggested that it was maybe official edicts that were put forth in the name of the emperor. I'm a little doubtful about that one. Uh, others have even suggested that there was some kind of a ceremony that went on. There are more than one references in ancient literature of sorcerers and priests who would give the appearance that statues could talk. These statues were made with movable pieces, somebody behind a curtain pulling a string to make the mouth move. Uh, there is reference to ventriloquism in ancient texts. People could make it sound as if a statue were talking to you. Uh, I've seen a couple of these uh, myself, and I can testify that these things really did exist. And the Romans weren't the only people that used them. The Egyptians had them as well. Uh, if you ever get to go to Chicago and go to the Oriental Institute, uh, in the Egyptian collection, there's a big statue of Horus, the falcon god, with a movable beak on it, and they've got a mirror under it. You can see the hole that's been drilled up through it to where a priest would pull a string and make the bird talk. Uh, that may be what John is referring to here some kind of something that would even give you the impression that the image was speaking. But even if it's not so literal, we certainly could understand it as being the operation of the commune of Asia passing its own resolutions to make sure that everybody showed their loyalty to the emperor. Well, verse 16, and he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And there has been a lot of speculation over the years as to exactly what this mark is. Obviously, it indicated that somebody was a follower of the beast. And it might not necessarily be something physical. And the reason we say that is because we have seen already that God marked his followers on their foreheads so that they would not be harmed in the plagues that God sent upon this wicked empire. And we don't suggest that there was some mark on the forehead of every Christian or anything like that. 
that it's a symbol of God knowing who belongs to him. And that certainly may be the uh, idea here as well, that there was a way to know just who had shown their loyalty to the emperor and who hadn't without it being some kind of mark literally on the forehead. Uh, some have suggested that it might be a reference to something that is called a libellus. Uh, this is a copy of one you see on the right side of the screen here. What a libellus was was a certificate signed by two official witnesses that somebody had sacrificed to the gods of Rome, including the emperor. Now this one, of course, dates from the 3rd century. This one's dated June 21st, 250 AD, from a later persecution when Christianity was outlawed. But this is one way that they had of telling who a Christian was and who wasn't. Because no Christian, they understood, would do such a thing. And so, how do you prove you're not a Christian? Well, you go down to the emperor's temple, you burn a pinch of incense, you say something to the statue, make your adoration known, two witnesses sign the piece of paper saying, we saw this person do it, you put that piece of paper in your pocket and you carry it around with you all the time. So if you're ever asked, are you a Christian, you just pull it out and say no, and here's the proof. Translation of this one, if you are interested, the, the writing is very poor, you can see. But notice what it says here. We have always been constant in sacrificing to the gods, and now too in your presence, in accordance with the regulations, I've poured libations and sacrificed and tasted the offerings, and I ask you to certify this for us below on this piece of paper, testifying that that is exactly the case. Uh, here's another one with a different date on it. But again, here's the attestation, witness number one, witness number two, signed at the bottom. Uh, here's another one from another place. Handwriting is a little different, but again, you can see this handwriting here, obviously different from the handwriting that witnesses it down at the bottom. And so some have suggested that maybe something like this is what John is talking about, that there was something that identified you as having participated in the emperor cult that would make it clear whether or not you had done this or not. Um, the word mark in verse 16 is also the word that is used of the emperor's likeness on coins. And for that reason, some have suggested that it was this coinage that was the mark that you received. And we noted a moment ago that these coins were minted that said C-O-M-A-S-I on them were minted by the commune of Asia. And it is not out of the realm of possibility that maybe you were given one of those coins or traded for one of those coins if you had done your duty to the emperor. For that reason, some have suggested it might be some kind of economic pressure that is being placed against Christians. And the reason for that is continuing on in verse 17. It says there that he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one that has the mark. Was it that you could only buy bread with one of those coins? And you could only get one of those coins if you had sacrificed to the emperor. Uh, that's not completely unlikely. I don't know if that we can prove that or not. But some have kind of put two and two together. They say, well, we've got the word that means image. We've got this reference to buying and selling, that that is a possible scenario. And I'll just leave it at that, that it is one possible explanation of what is going on. But some kind of economic distress is clearly uh, being described here. And there is some archaeological evidence that suggests that this might be what was going on. What you're looking at here is part of the city of Ephesus as it now sits. And this big spot out here is where the temple to the emperor stood. And these arches that you see were built to keep the ground from collapsing under the weight of the temple. So you have to imagine 
a temple standing on that large flat spot right there. And that was a pretty large temple, even by ancient standards. Not as big as the one in Ephesus, but uh, a huge temple stood there in ancient times. Now, interestingly enough, the spot where these people are standing, this whole area out here, is the marketplace in Ephesus. It's where you want to buy food and vegetables and meat and things like that. And so here is the marketplace. Right back there is where the emperor's temple stood. And so some have looked at Revelation chapter 13 and said, is there some kind of connection? Could it not be that you weren't allowed to buy anything in the marketplace unless you had first gone through the temple? Well, the archaeological remains seem to suggest that there may have been some connection between those two. Uh, interestingly also, uh, this is again a, a diagram of uh, the city of Ephesus. This is that large temple, that platform area that you were just looking at. This is the marketplace, so we're kind of turned around in a different direction here. But uh, in this marketplace was a temple. And uh, one of the foremost experts, well, you take him for what you want to, uh, but a guy that has studied Revelation a lot, uh, Stephen Friesen, uh, has identified that as a temple to Augustus. I think he's correct about that. I don't think it was anything other than a temple to Augustus. You can see the platform back there. That's where the main temple stood. And you see this little square area. That's where there was a temple of Augustus. Now that temple is right in the middle of this marketplace with the large temple to the emperor down at the end. It seems that there was some kind of connection between buying in this marketplace and worshiping the emperor. It seems that the buildings are just too close to each other for that to be coincidence. And here again, this is the marketplace, this is the corner, so all of this area in ancient times where this guy is walking here, there would have been columns, a roof over it, shops going all around this, and at the back stood that large temple to the emperor. So we don't really know what the mark of the beast was. It went all that way to say that. It could have been three or four things, uh, three or four possibilities that have been suggested. But whatever it was, it seems that there was something that was being done to try to pressure Christians into worshiping the beast. And maybe the commune of Asia was doing something about that. Well then, uh, let's look at the name. Verse 17, it, nobody can buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. The number of a man. And a lot of people have tried to play around with this and have suggested that this is a reference to Nero. Uh, in Greek, Nero's name would look like this. And in Hebrew, it would look like this. And in ancient languages like Greek and Hebrew, there were no numerals. You use letters of the alphabet for numbers. And so if you take these letters for their numerical value, add them all up, in Hebrew, it comes out to be 666. Uh, there are, however, several problems uh, with that particular identification. Uh, we can go into those if you want to, but I don't think that it is a reference to Nero at all. I think we ought to just listen to what John says. <clears throat> it is that of a man. Not of a specific man, but of a man. That is, not of a god, but of a man. Seven is the number that is often associated with the divine. Six is one less than seven and denotes what is human very often. There are three of these sixes together. 
Three, of course, is the number of the Trinity. And so three sixes would suggest that maybe this symbol refers to a man pretending to be a god or a man in the place of God, which would be an apt description of the Roman emperor cult. And so whatever this mark is, it has got either the name or some kind of designation uh, of this person who claims to be or is worshipped as a god, and yet he is nothing but a man. Uh, in order to get 666 to work, you have to spell his name in a weird way. And if you spell it in the normal way, take this letter off that is 50, then you wind up with 616. So the scribes thought it was Nero and said, whoops, Nero only adds up to 616, so they put that in the margins of the manuscripts. It's hard for us to imagine, and I can't really think of an illustration in uh, modern times that, that we have anything really like this. But imagine the pressure that these Christians were under. You know, why don't you just go into the temple, offer a pinch of incense, and get it over with, and then everything will be fine, and people won't hate you so much. And Christians, yeah, but I can't do that. And under all this pressure, John says, you know, you need to realize what this is. Now, it might sound like, oh, this is good for our town. Everything's fine. You know, just go along with it. This is satanic. It seems to me that John is just kind of putting that in there for emphasis. All right, then. Uh, thank you again for your good attention, for your input tonight. We will try to get into chapter 14 next week.